What's going on guys? This is Rob and welcome back to Comics Explained and it's time for another top 10 video as we continue our ride on this bandwagon until it runs out. And the Marvel Cinematic Universe is a family friendly environment, right? They're owned by Disney. It's it's mom and dad and little Timmy and whatever their daughter's name is. And they go see the Marvel movies and just have a rip roaring good time. And because of that, this is a list of the 10 stories in my mind, the top 10 stories that the Marvel Cinematic Universe probably will never be able to make just because of how dark they are. And kicking our list off, we actually have a what if story from what if issue number 94 called Juggernaut, the Kingdom of Cain, or as I like to call it, Juggernaut kills the Marvel Universe. Literally what happens in this story is that it's somewhere along the line in their initial confrontation in Marvel Comics, the Juggernaut kills Professor Xavier. Shortly after that, the Sentinel program's activated and you kind of get days of future past like in the movie when the Sentinels were basically killing mutants everywhere they could find them. The difference here is that the first thing the Sentinels did is they killed the Avengers and the Fantastic Four. Dunzo, wiped those guys out, and pretty much any non-mutant superpowered being that was there. Following that, they turned on their creator, who was presumably Stephen Lang, no relation to Scott Lang, and that they ultimately modified their own programming. And when they did that, they basically started kind of emitting this lethal radiation across the world. Kane Marco is the only being on Earth that's immune to it, likely because of the Crimson Gem of Sidorak and his cosmic enhancements from the cosmic entity Sidorak. If you guys don't know who that is, check out the last video that we made at the end of this video, which is the top 10 characters that are too powerful for the MCU. But the thing behind this is that Kane Marco basically travels the world trying to find life, humanity, anything, and he just can't really find it at all until he ultimately stumbles across a giant cavern that has the Iceman Bobby Drake. And when Iceman will not let Juggernaut through, Juggernaut's temper gets the better of him and he kills Bobby Drake by smashing through the ice wall. He finds this just great big huge door and when he gets inside, he finds Quicksilver and he finds Scarlet Witch and he finds humanity and he finds a whole bunch of mutants and they're all gathered together they're all united under the singular cause of trying to survive kane marco's excited he's so happy to see him and they immediately cuss him out and the reason why is because by smashing down the barrier he let in the lethal radiation he's going to kill them all they're all going to die because of radiation poisoning and so kane marco ended up killing what was left of humanity on earth pretty bleak but i will say this none of the stories on this list are anywhere near as bleak as number one, and I'm sure most people who are familiar with my channel know exactly which that one's gonna be. But coming in at number nine is Punisher versus the Marvel Universe. By the way, we're gonna have a few Punisher videos on this list because, you know, Frank Castle's pretty dark. So there's Punisher kills the Marvel Universe, then there's Punisher versus the Marvel Universe. Punisher versus the Marvel Universe, in my opinion, is actually the darkest of the two. And here's the reason why. While it is Punisher versus the Marvel Universe, it's more of a Spider-Man centric story. But what ended up happening is Peter Parker was basically infected with a virus that was similar to a zombie virus, but not quite. And that Peter Parker ended up infecting the people in the city of New York. The problem is this virus had an incubation period. So much like COVID-19, people who were on planes didn't know they had it and they scattered it to the rest of the world and when that happened the entire world basically collapsed but that's not what makes the story dark what makes the story dark are the things that happen to the various superheroes in this story here's a really good example iron man you ever imagine what it would be like if iron man's suit just shut down and he died inside of it that happens in this story that in the midst of this whole great big huge thing there's basically an emp effectively that goes off and when that happens iron man's suit shuts down and as soon as the suit shuts down he's stuck inside of it now there's one point in the story and it's it's kind of chilling and pretty haunting but there's one point in the story where punisher is talking about it and he's like they said it was like three days or five days or something like that before the screaming finally stopped so as soon Eventually, Iron Man's suit became a tomb and he screamed for like three to five days to get people to get him out of there. Nobody could get the suit open and he ultimately died trapped inside of his own Iron Man suit. Those of you guys out there who are claustrophobic, Hey, <laughs> it's a terrible situation, man. It was pretty bad. But moving on to number eight is a story that we actually got a bit of a variation of, but not quite. Old Man Logan. Now, Old Man Logan is a story that has not officially had a comic adaptation done in movie form. The closest we got was Logan, but they changed a few things. For example, Xavier was the one who killed the X-Men and there basically were no other superheroes. In Old Man Logan, it's a whole different beast. So the Logan film feels more like X-Men meets the Unforgiven movie. If you guys ever saw Unforgiven, phenomenal film if you haven't seen it already. But the way this played out is that in the Old Man Logan universe, the Red Skull had come to the realization that because all the different 
different villains had been losing to all the different superheroes instead of just repeating the same process where Mysterio fights Spider-Man and different things like that. Why not switch things around and why not take villains and have them face off against superheroes based on their abilities and who they're the most suited for. And so what ends up happening here is Jubilee, who's kind of like the cheerleader of the X-Men, is basically just chilling in the X-Men mansion one day. And then suddenly it's just a boatload of SOS calls. The Fantastic Four, the Avengers, Alpha Flight, who nobody cares about, the Inhumans who, you know, rightfully die. Those guys suck. They can't do anything. But basically everybody was asking for help. Right at that moment, all the most notable villains of the X-Men come busting into the Xavier Institute. Juggernaut, Apocalypse, like, like Omega Red, all those guys. Wolverine is like the only one present, right? He pops his claws. He's getting the kids out of there. He's killing all the bad guys. Wolverine flies into a berserker rage and slaughters them all. And then right at that moment, Mysterio shows up and Mysterio says, the villains of this earth, thank you for your contribution, Wolverine. Come to find out, the Red Skull realized that because Wolverine's entire thing is his senses, his sense of smell and touch and taste and all that kind of stuff, who better to manipulate those senses than Mysterio, the master of illusions? So all those villains were never there. Instead of Wolverine killing the various villains that had shown up that were part of the X-Men's roster, what Wolverine had been doing was killing the X-Men. Following that, he basically just refuses to pop his claws for the next 50 years. And that's just the tip of the iceberg, right? Like pretty much all the superheroes that you know of die. Like Ant-Man dies. And in fact, there's this kid that discovers the helmet of Ant-Man and charges people like a nickel or something like that to cross a bridge. Those who don't do it, he commands the ants to eat them. It's pretty brutal. The Incredible Hulk has his whole thing, which like the Hulk family and all that kind of stuff. It's a whole different beast. The Hulk family is the result of like this crazy relationship between the Incredible Hulk and She-Hulk because they both went insane because of the radiation and started procreating. There's other theories as to how it happened, which we won't talk about here. But the important thing is that the universe is pretty bleak and it's pretty dark. Kind of a fun fact, you end up finding out Old Man Logan crosses over into the main Marvel Universe following the death of the original Wolverine, and his stories are really, really cool. But following that, we go into number seven, which is Thor Vikings. And Thor Vikings is probably a story you've never heard of. We have covered it here on Comics Explained. That was part of Marvel Max. For those of you guys who don't know what Marvel Max is, once upon a time, and when I say once upon a time, I mean like in 2001, Marvel had the question, what if we created stories that had like nudity and cussing and the whole nine yards, and they were geared for adults? Enter Marvel Max. So this Thor story basically deals with Vikings coming back from the dead and then trying to conquer the city of Manhattan. And Thor has to face off against them. It's not really the premise of the story that makes it dark. This is one of those kind of stereotypical blood and guts, cussing, hyper violence, all that kind of stuff. It's one of those kind of stories. Not a whole lot to go on here, but it's just the insane sheer level of violence in this story is enough that they couldn't do it, right? Like imagine the Deadpool film, but like three times more violent and a Marvel Cinematic Universe property. It's just not gonna happen. But speaking of Deadpool, Deadpool kills the Marvel Universe. So this story is just one of the funniest stories that you're ever going to see. And honestly, I could see the Marvel Cinematic Universe adapting this story to a degree in the way that like Old Man Logan was adapted in the film Logan. So just changing some stuff around, but more or less having the same general premise. But for those of you guys who don't know, Deadpool Kills the Marvel Universe is actually part of a trilogy that you have Deadpool Kills the Marvel Universe, then you have Deadpool Illustrated, and then you have Deadpool Kills Deadpool. So the way this played out is that in an alternate reality, Deadpool was just as insane as you expect him to be. And so there was basically an attempt to cure him of his insanity. The consequence of this was that he actually realized he was a fictional character, that nothing that was happening was real. So he just starts killing everybody, like literally everyone. The first issue opens with him killing Uatu the Watcher. And this guy does it in some of the most insane, but also creative ways. So in order to kill Luke Cage, because Luke Cage has bulletproof skin, Deadpool ends up taking like explosives and use pim particles to shrink them down. And so when Luke Cage was eating food, he was actually eating bombs. And then Deadpool detonates him and kills Luke Cage. It was stuff like that, right? It was just crazy circumstances like that. It was amazing. It was phenomenal. Somehow he managed to kill Galactus. We never found out how, but the story is phenomenal because it's just this great blend of like comedy and action and lots and lots of killing, but it is amazing. <laughs> we also have that video here on Comics Explained and what I'll do in order to make things easier for you all so you don't have to keep track yourself is down in the comments section, you will see a link to all the different videos that we've done that basically are on this list, assuming that we've done them, right? If we haven't, 
then let me know down in the comments and I'll certainly cover one of them. But moving on past Deadpool Kills the Marvel Universe and into our number five spot is a story that most of you out there who have never read comics have never heard of, but it's one of my all time favorites, God Loves, Man kills now this is a great story and there are ample reasons as to why the marvel cinematic universe won't do this here's the first reason so in this story you basically have a guy named william striker and this guy is probably one of the greatest villains ever introduced in marvel comics this guy has no powers he does he's not a telepath he can't alter reality he can't move things with his mind none of that stuff instead the beauty of william striker is that he's a religious fundamentalist who thinks it's his mission from god to kill mutants and so what he does is he ends up forming a group called the purifiers this story opens up with the purifiers chasing down these kids and like that's it it's it opens up like that now the reality here is that when this story was written by chris claremont it was less about like the ultra violence and all that kind of stuff and it was designed to be an allegory of race relations in the united states at the time and so instead of the comic book ending with some great big huge fight between the x-men and the purifiers which that does actually happen in the story and it's amazing like when they capture when they kidnap like professor xavier and like other x-men it's pretty baller the purifiers they knew what they were doing man and they were very, very organized. But the comic actually ends with a debate between Cyclops and William Stryker. And what Cyclops does is he actually argues if God created humanity and the mutant population is a genetic offshoot of humanity, then we're the reason, like God's the reason we exist in the first place. But he basically corners William Stryker using his own logic. And so William Stryker pulls a gun and then he shoots a Cyclops and I think he hits Nightcrawler. Then he's arrested by the cops. So like, that's basically it. The guy gets taken away because the world sees him for what he is, which is just a crazy religion just fanatic and then all the people who sided with him basically have to look other people in the eye and just kind of be like yeah i got swept up in the fervor of you know religious zealotry yeah, hey i'm gonna go grab a beer you know just, it happens you know i don't know what to tell you right like that kind of a thing so it was it was it was kind of nuts but the story itself is great but there's a multitude of reasons why the mcu won't do this first of all if they introduce a villain and basically the reason why he's a bad guy is it because of his religious zealotry they're gonna piss off all the christians in the united states right like 80 percent of the u.s population is going to be pissed some subsect of that is probably going to protest so they don't want to end up losing that kind of money so they're not going to make that but you also had a moment in the comic when you had a girl named kitty pride and kitty pride who most of you know from just the x-men films produced by fox that she is a character that can walk through walls but she has a friend who's a human and this friend is named frankie who is a black woman what ends up happening is somebody runs up on kitty pride and frankie and then literally starts calling frankie like a mutant lover and that kind of thing and frankie tells kitty pride well you have to let it go because Kitty Pride starts freaking out. And so Kitty Pride looks at her and says, would you say the same thing if they made a statement similar to that, but based on your skin color, would you respond the same way? Would you say, well, you got to let it go, right? Or would it piss you off? You know, and so it's one of those really, really cool circumstances in the comic that was designed to talk about race relations back then. And Chris Claremont, put the word in there. He didn't censor it out. It was not censored out at all. It's there for the world to see, but it was a landmark and significant story. But for those reasons, never gonna be in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. But we get into the number four spot. This is Hulk the end now in marvel comics you had a series of comics that were called the end they were basically like the end of the road for different superheroes in some cases they just retired and passed the mantle on to the next generation for other heroes things were really bleak for the incredible hulk the way this played out is that the world had just been engulfed in a nuclear holocaust right like literally just everybody was essentially killed the heroes all that kind of stuff the only life left on earth are basically whatever's irradiated like giant bugs and things like that or the incredible hulk slash bruce banner but bruce banner is actually aging up that he's not immortal right he doesn't stay youthful forever so he's basically an old man at this point now the incredible hulk is aging as well right he's got gray hair different things like that but one of the things that it talks about is this idea that like bruce banner sets up surveillance systems to see what happens to the incredible hulk when the incredible hulk persona takes over because at this point in time marvel had not established that bruce banner could still understand what the hulk was doing when the hulk persona had essentially manifested and so as a result of this the the bruce banner sees things like like the Incredible Hulk every day basically gets eaten alive by like these giant irradiated bugs and then heal.
So in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, when Mark Ruffalo was talking about trying to take that route, which you should never do, this is the story that they got that from. And there were other stories where that kind of thing happened as well. But the reality here is that it's incredibly bleak. There does come a point when the Bruce Banner persona dies of a heart attack and the Incredible Hulk finally gets what he always wanted, which is to be left alone. But the Incredible Hulk is the only living thing on Earth, the sole survivor of the Earth itself outside of just giant bugs and things like that. But the story ends on a really bleak and sad note because effectively what you're being told is that from that point until whenever the Incredible Hulk happens to die of old age, which could be thousands of years, he'll be the only being on Earth that life will never come back because it's just an irradiated wasteland, life can't grow. So it's pretty brutal and it's pretty dark, but it's nowhere near as dark as our top three stories. So coming in at number three is another comic that belongs to The End. And I'm sure those of you guys who were a fan of my channel knew that this story was coming, Punisher, the end. This is a bleak and a dark story. So very similar to the premise of Hulk the end that the world had been engulfed in a nuclear war. The difference here is that Frank Castle, along with a handful of other prisoners, basically end up surviving the whole thing because they're locked in a bunker. But along the way, Frank Castle finds out that there's actually another bunker out there in the world that houses the wealthy and powerful of the world. Cue YouTube demonetizing this video because it doesn't show brands in a positive light. But the thing behind this is that that Frank Castle realizes that it was like government officials and it was corporations and things like that that pushed the world to the brink where this nuclear war even happened in the first place. But Frank Castle makes his way along the irradiated wasteland after killing all the prisoners who were left in that prison. And literally it's stuff like the clouds are on fire from like the nuclear explosions and things like that. But he ends up finally coming across the bunker where there's survivors. And once he gets in there, it really is all these businessmen and businesswomen and like politicians and so on and so forth. And what they're doing is they're actually setting up an entire reproduction chamber that what they had done here is they had found a means to basically grow human beings and what they would do is repopulate the earth well frank castle comes to the decision that if people who run corporations ceos and all these crooked politicians and all that kind of stuff if they're the ones that caused all of this in the first place and they start repopulating the earth they're going to screw it up so he kills all the politicians and businessmen and businesswomen who were there and then he turns his sites to like those little tiny incubation chambers. And he basically decides that humanity is a horrible thing. Humanity is just a terrible thing, right? All humanity is going to do is screw things up because he's an extreme misanthrope. Humanity will learn nothing from its mistakes. So the best thing that Frank Castle can do for the world itself is to eliminate what's left of humanity. So he destroys them all. And by doing so with all the doctors and everything, like that bunker was the last one because they show him or they, they have him listen to like a broadcast from the bunker where the president was. The president had gone insane. He'd kill everybody in the bunker and then took himself out, right? So it was, it was nuts. It was a pretty wild thing, but eradicating what's left of humanity, Frank Castle just kind of wanders into the flames and dies of radiation sickness. And so Punisher effectively kills everybody on earth. But following this, we go into number two, which is not really just one story, but a series of stories. Punisher Max by Garth Ennis. So Punisher Max is considered the de definitive Punisher run. If ever there were a series of comics that you should read that belong to the Punisher, it's Punisher Max. And like, that's it, right? It's just, they're, they're phenomenal stories. Punisher Born is basically the explanation of how Frank Castle became Frank Castle outside of like the death of his family, that like, it was not the death of his family that sent him down that path, that he had basically made a deal with the devil years beforehand when he was in the Vietnam War. It was absolutely crazy. But Punisher Max just has a series of hyper-violent, extremely crazy stories where like some of the most insane things happen, right? Girls in white dresses. Uh, oh my God, the slavers. Barracuda was another crazy one that happened. I would say probably the single greatest monologue was Up is Down and Black is White, where Frank Castle talks about how like he has this dream from time to time. And in this dream, like he doesn't stop. He kills all the politicians, drug dealers, the whole nine yards. And then he looks around and he sees all these people who had like elected these crooked politicians and all these people who stood by and did nothing as the world fall, uh, fell apart. And he sees just people in general as being the problem, right? He's like, politicians didn't just walk into office and take it. You put them there, which means you're as screwed up as they are because you didn't see a problem with them. So what he says is in this dream that basically he starts to pull the trigger and then he wakes up. But it's kind of a prelude to the events of like Punisher the End, where ultimately Frank Castle's actions of dooming the entirety of humanity come to fruition, but not quite directly because this sort of came before all that stuff. 
it's amazing, right? It's just a ridiculously awesome story, but it's way too dark and way too violent for the Marvel Cinematic Universe. But this leads us to number one. What is arguably the single, not even arguably, what is inarguably, definitively, resolutely, absolutely, not a debatable point, the single darkest story in the entirety of Marvel Comics, Marvel Ruins. So Marvel Ruins, oh my God, we cover this story, right? Everything, like the like the worst case scenario happens in Marvel Comics. Marvel Ruins is unnecessarily dark. It is unnecessarily brutal, right? It's terrible. So here's the thing, you know how like in Marvel Comics, Bruce Banner is exposed to the Gamma Bomb and he becomes the Incredible Hulk instead of just dying as an irradiated mass of tumors, which is what would happen in the real world? That happens in this story, that instead of the superheroes undergoing these experiences, right, these crazy experiments, and then in turn, like, becoming superheroes, they succumb to what would likely happen in the real world. So like when Marvel and the Kree show up on Earth, they're put in an internment camp and like disease and all that kind of stuff is rampant. Enchantress from the Asgardian mythos, she's an adult film star. Like Nick Fury goes crazy and basically offs himself because he's like, the world is so screwed. Jean Grey of the X-Men's a hooker. I mean, it's stuff like that, right? Probably the single craziest moment that happens in this story. It's probably the, the single most just bat shit moment ever in the history of a Marvel comic, check this out, it's absolutely bonkers. So what ends up happening is, I think it's the reporter, somebody, somebody's on an airplane and Mystique is there, right? Mystique is a shapeshifter. The problem with this is that unlike Marvel comics where Mystique just shapeshifts into people and all that kind of stuff and does whatever she wants to do. In Marvel Ruins, she's gone insane because of all the people she's duplicated. So all those personalities are all swirling up there in her head and she starts to lose control of her powers on the flight. While that's going on, you end up having something going on with Magneto because it all takes place in an airport. I can't remember exactly what it is that happens with Magneto, but whatever the case is, instead of Magneto being a guy that can like control magnetism on a whim, that what he has is basically a power dampening harness because he can't control his magnetic powers. The power dampening harness is basically damaged. And when that happens, everything around Magneto just gets directly pulled into him because he's like a giant magnet, right? Like every piece of metal, the plane explodes, just all kinds of crazy violence and, and crazy situations. It's one of those, one of the darkest stories out there, right? It's just one of the single darkest stories. What's also really messed up here is that Professor Xavier does exist in that story, but his situation is very cloak and dagger. That what it looks like is that instead of him becoming the leader of the X-Men and teaching them how to use their powers and different things like that, that he's made himself president of the United States by using his telepathy and then in turn experiments on the mutant population. Like, you know, well, welding Cyclops' eyes shut different things like that it's it's dark the story is crazy dark suffice it to say you will never ever under any circumstances see Marvel ruins in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. That's never going to happen. But with that being said guys we're gonna bring this video to an end. Thank you all for watching and I will catch you all later. Peace.